disclaimer, this instructional tool is created to enable students to develop their test taking skills. The question or questions and answer or answers contained in this instructional video were patterned after the official publicly accessed samples from the RN test plan of the National Council of State Boards of Nursing or NCSBN. The discussions and rationale presented in the video are based on the lecturer's research and are meant to provide an explanation for the answer or answers to the question or questions that is or are presented. The lecturer makes no claim directly implied or otherwise that the rationale discussed is officially endorsed by NCSBN. Good day learners once again. This is Mentor Ray and for today we're going to talk about electroconvulsive therapy. Now just to start today with some trivial things. It was initially uh, introduced by two Italian psychiatrists by the name of Ugo Serlet and Luciano Bini in 1938. Uh, initially, ECT was actually used for patients with uh, signs of psychosis and then patients with mood disorders. And then eventually, it, were, it was also used to address depression associated with Parkinson's disease, okay, and other forms of degenerative disorders, okay? So today, we'll talk about the concepts related to ECT that you need to learn for the NCLEX RN. Okay, so let's begin our focus with a functional concept. ECT is by far the most effective and evidence-based brain stimulation technique. And the absolute contraindication for ECT are conditions that could increase intracranial pressure like the presence of brain tumor, okay, or the presence of um, stroke that could have led to hemorrhage, okay. Those conditions could actually increase intracranial pressure. Other than that, some other conditions could be considered as relative contraindications to ECT. For example, pregnancy is not necessarily a contraindication to ECT. However, if the patient is already having a complicated pregnancy, then the doctor may opt not to do ECT. But still, it's not an absolute contraindication. So the doctor may have the last say on that. Okay, so here's a sample question. Recent studies suggest that the electrically induced seizures during electroconvulsive therapy help improve the patient's condition. Which patient may undergo electroconvulsive therapy? Select all that apply. Now we have to remember the concept that we have a while back that says any condition that increases intracranial pressure could be considered as a contraindication to ECT. So number one, 51 year old with glioblastoma multiform, this is actually a form of brain tumor. So it could potentially increase intracranial pressure. So we put an X. 35 year old pregnant patient. So that's not a, uh, an absolute contraindication to ECT. So we put a check, the patient may still undergo. The procedure, 65 year old with depression related to multiple sclerosis, I told you a while back, ECT is used for patients with depression associated with degenerative conditions, yes. 60 year old with cerebral embolism, once again, you have here a form of stroke, so we put an X. 63 year old with Parkinson's disease with depression, yes, so we put a check, okay? So the answers are 35 year old pregnant woman, 65 year old with depression related to multiple sclerosis, and 63 year old with Parkinson's disease with depression. Okay, so here's a functional concept. Glioblastoma multiform, these are the most aggressive and infiltrative tumors that don't metastasize outside the brain. So they remain within the brain that could potentially eventually lead to increased intracranial pressure. So here's a sample question again. Which of the following statements is true regarding electroconvulsive therapy? One, most patients need six to 12 treatments or four to 20 for severe depression. Yes, usually the frequency of doing ECT is that the interval should be 48 hours. And some experts suggest that we don't go beyond the prescribed treatment, otherwise memory loss could become permanent. Okay, memory loss that occurs after ECT could become permanent if it's done beyond the prescribed treatment. So yes, this is actually true. So we put a check. It will involve EEG, ECG, pulse oximetry, and oxygen administration before the procedure. Now these are actually the procedures that are needed to ensure that the patient is not having or um, manifesting signs and symptoms of pre-existing conditions that may potentially um, add on 
to whatever the patient will experience during the procedure. For example, what if the patient had a history of myocardial infarction? So on the client's ECG finding, you'll see um, a manifestation that would tell you that indeed the patient had history of MI, okay? So therefore, since this is already history of MI, it's not presently being experienced by the patient. So we could consider this as not a contraindication. I could consider a history of MI as not a contraindication since it has been um, experienced by the patient in the past. So it's just part of the patient's history. However, it would also alert the members of the healthcare team that they have to be very careful since potential complications could result from the patient having um, myocardial infarction in the past, okay? So yes, we put a check. Propofol or methohexital will be administered to induce sleep for five to 10 minutes now. Your methohexital or propofol, these are actually uh, pre-anesthetic medications that are administered to the patient such that um, it's very important for the members of the health team to eventually monitor the patient's level of consciousness and breathing because of the after effects of these drugs. So we put a check. So sinilcholine, a muscle relaxant, is administered, yes. And you have to pay particular attention to a common adverse effect of sinilcholine, which is respiratory depression. That's due to the fact that even the muscles of breathing would actually be relaxed with the administration of sinilcholine. That's why it's very important to assess the respiratory rate of the patient after ECP. So we put a check. Okay, improvement is noticeable after a week or after two to four treatments. Yes, and if the patient would usually ask how long would a single treatment of ECT take, it would usually take 10 to 15 minutes, okay? And it is an invasive procedure. It is not an invasive procedure. It is a non-invasive procedure, okay? So let's move on. Now this time, you have a question. Before electroconvulsive therapy, the nurse should perform which of the following? Select all that apply. Let's go through it and let's discuss as we try to analyze each of the items on this question. Check for written informed consent from guardian. Now there's something that makes this wrong. Usually the written informed consent should come from the patient himself, not from the guardian. So we put an X. Remove artificial dentures. Yes, it could potentially dislodge during the uh, post-ECT seizures and may harm the patient. So it's better if we remove the dentures beforehand. So we put a check. Remove the lipstick, nail polish, or makeup. That would be easier for the nurse to assess when the patient is having complications associated with the treatment. So we put a, a check. Allow the use of preferred clothes. Now, usually... Uh, clothes that could be constrictive are not allowed. That's why it's better that the patient would wear the hospital laboratory gown. So we put an X. Ensure that the hair is oil-free, yes, and stay with the patient, definitely, to reassure the patient and to ensure that assessment would be ongoing while the patient is going to have the treatment. So let's move on. Here this time, you have a question that says, during electroconvulsive therapy, the nurse should perform which of the following? Once again, let's analyze each option. Select all that apply. Put the patient in a side-lying position. Now, this is not done because during ECT, the patient is actually on, uh, lying flat on bed, okay? Insert a padded mouth gag, okay. Yes, this is needed uh, to prevent the patient from potentially biting the tongue during the seizures, okay? Ensure suction and oxygen are available at the bedside, yes. Expect that there will always be tonic-clonic seizures. No, sometimes the administration of the shock may not result to tonic-clonic seizures. So there are times in which tonic-clonic seizures do not result, so doctors may opt to reapply. Okay, once again, they, they reapply the electrical shock such that okay, tonic-clonic seizures could result. So could we therefore say that um, the optimum effect of ECT is achieved when tonic-clonic seizure results? Yes. And usually, a common reaction of the brain after tonic-clonic seizures is that you have a tendency to fall asleep. So if a patient after ECT tells the nurse, I want to fall asleep, then by all means allow the patient because that's an expected reaction of the brain from the seizures, okay? And then prevent fracture and falls. Yes, 
Okay. Here's another question this time asking you after electroconvulsive therapy, the nurse should perform which of the following? So I call that apply. Prioritize monitoring the heart rate. Okay, we put an X. I told you a while back that due to the administration of succinylcholine or anictine, it should be the respiratory rate that could be potentially depressed with the pre-meds that were given. That should be the priority for the nurse to monitor. And then put the side rails up, yes. Position the patient laterally, yes, to promote drainage of secretions. Avoid bathing the patient after the procedure. Um, this is not a necessary precaution. So you may actually bathe the patient after a procedure. Then allow the patient to sleep to recover from the seizures, yes. I told you about it a while back. Okay, here's a functional concept. Complications of ECT includes fluctuation of the blood pressure, headache. It's one of the first thing that the patient would tell you that he's having a headache. So tell the patient that it could go away and then check if the doctor has prescribed medications for the headache. And then temporary memory loss that could potentially become permanent if um, ECT is done more than the prescribed number of times that it should be done. Then confusion could result, so that's why we need to reorient the patient properly after the procedure, poor concentration, and of course, there's going to be pain and discomfort. So let's try to compare ECT with RTMS. Now, RTMS stands for Repetitive Transcranial Magnetic Stimulation. Okay, this is how patient undergoing that procedure would look like. Okay, so... The treatment would usually involve the use of this equipment with a treatment coil, okay, that is actually um, designed to make use of a magnetic field to stimulate a specific part of the brain. So one of the advantages of RTMS is that you could actually target the part of the brain within which you can apply the treatment that is intended. Okay, so RTMS is used to treat depression and anxiety. Well, that's one of the similarities between your ECT and RTMS. ECT and RTMS could both be used to treat depression, okay? RTMS is recommended only when medications and psychotherapy fail to work. RTMS is an alternative to ECT when a patient is unable to tolerate anesthesia and have higher risk for seizures. So, if the patient could actually tolerate anesthesia and they're not at risk for seizures, then it's better to use ECT. Here's a sample question. Which of the following statements are true about RTMS? Select all that apply. The procedure may last up to one hour. Yes, okay, so compare that to ECT. ECT could last 10 to 15 minutes. RTMS is a little longer, okay, approximately an hour. Two, the patient may sit up or recline during RTMS. Yes, and again, compare that to ECT, the patient they're going, ECT is usually, usually, okay, uh, on a supine position, okay. Three, an electromagnetic coil is placed on the forehead. Yes, that's another difference. In ECT, you have your electric shock that's administered from 0 0.05 to 6 seconds, okay, in which 110 to 150 volts of electric shock is delivered. That's in your ECT, whereas in your RTMS, okay, you have an electromagnetic coil instead, okay? So there's no more need for um, the anesthetic medications, okay? Number four for RTMS. Four, the prefrontal cortex of the brain is targeted. Yes, that's one of the advantages of the RTMS. It is uh, capable of targeting a specific part of the brain. And a knocking or tapping feeling may occur with RTMS. That's expected. And pain is a side effect of the procedure? No. Pain is associated with ECT and not with RTMS, okay? So if a patient who is about to undergo ECT would ask you, will I experience some degree of pain? You have to be honest and say, yeah. But if a patient with um, depression who is supposed to be undergoing RTMS would ask you if there will be pain with the procedure, well, the answer is definitely there's no pain, okay? So that would be one statement that could potentially reassure your patient who is about to undergo RTMS. Okay, here's a functional concept. Complications of RTMS include like ECT, mild headache, lightheadedness, temporary hearing problems, and tingling in the face, jaw, or scalp. So the big difference, therefore, is the fact that you have temporary memory loss in ECT and you don't have that in RTMS, okay? So let's compare the two. So ECT involves causing seizures using electricity, while RTMS involves use of electromagnetic scan. 
ECT cannot target specific parts of the brain. Your RTMS can target specific parts of the brain. Your ECT requires sedation, while your RTMS does not. Okay, so let's have a test and let's try to figure out if you are able to retain some of the concepts that we just learned. So here's a sample question. Which of the following statements best describes how electroconvulsive therapy improves the condition of a patient with depression? Now remember, the exact mechanism of action of ECT is unknown. However, it is believed that the electric shock that is delivered may eventually alter the neurotransmitters in the brain leading to improvement of the signs of depression. So the best answer that we have is option A. Although the exact mechanism of how ECT relieves depression is unknown, it is believed that it delivers electrical stimulation to the brain that induces seizures, which will help improve the signs of depression. Let's move on to the next question. Electroconvulsive therapy is commonly indicated to improve signs and symptoms of which one of the following conditions? Definitely. Okay, initially your ECT was used for patients with depression, acute mania, and uh, patients with schizophrenia who exhibits catatonia. So it's not um, used for patients with mental retardation, ADHD, or ASD. So the best answer is letter B. Three, which of the following conditions are the indications for the use of electroconvulsive therapy? Select all that apply, okay? So the answers are, as I've said, mania, schizophrenia, and major depression. Your autism spectrum disorder, mental, retarda mental retardation, and attention deficit hyperactivity disorder are conditions which are not um, improved with the use of ECT at the moment. Okay, so which one of the following patients is not eligible to undergo electroconvulsive therapy? We've talked about the contraindications of ECT a while back. So we've said that any patient with conditions that could potentially increase the intracranial pressure should not undergo ECT. And among the options that we have here, it's letter D, 57-year-old patient with brain tumor. Excellent. And number five, which of the following conditions may result from electroconvulsive therapy? Select all that apply. Okay, so once again, this question is asking you about complications of ECT. And complications, you have confusion, respiratory depression, and headache. Remember, decreased heart rate may not occur. In fact, when atrophin sulfate is administered prior to ECT, it could potentially increase the heart rate of the patient. And because of the uh, pre-ECT medications that are administered, which have um, drying effect, like for example, atrophin sulfate, it will not result to excessive salivation, but the patient would actually have dry mouth instead, okay? So once again, it's shout out time. Congratulations to this pretty lady from Batasan Hills, Quezon City, Charlene Percol Ramas, USRN for the State Board of Texas. It just passed very recently, July 28th. Congratulations, Charlene, and may your great American dreams come true. Your RE Gapus family is one with you in praying for that. So let's learn together. For more instructional videos, subscribe to my YouTube channel, Gapus Mentors, and my Facebook page, Mentor Ray. If you want me to cover any concepts in nursing, please feel free to send in your request to my email, mentor.raygapus at gmail.com. Now, sometimes please do bear with me because it takes quite a while before I'm able to create videos because we're receiving a lot of requests right now. But I would definitely cover all your requests. That's a promise.